Australian wine has traditionally been known for its big flavour and fruity character, but there's a bit of a change in the air with winemakers turning to more delicate styles, perhaps with a bit more finesse. And one of the things that I love about the Australian wine scene is that they bring their typically relaxed, down-to-earth approach to a world that doesn't need to be stuffy. The bottom line is we work so hard and it's so serious what we're doing, but on the flip side is you've still got to have fun. A visit to a winery in Australia is all about celebrating the greatness of the grape. Many offer cellar doors where you can eat and drink splendidly well in cool contemporary spaces. We understand that wine has just got to be a beautiful drink and you know you put that with some wood-fired pizza and good roasted coffee, you can't help but kind of enjoy it. I'm here in Melbourne, this is the Yarra River, and just an hour upstream is a region playing a big part in this Australian wine revolution. The highlands surrounding the Yarra Valley in its cooler climate offer an opportunity to produce wines that radiate character, such as lively Pinot Noirs and bright, refreshing Chardonnays. Steve Flamsteed at Innocent Bystander believes there has been a real shift in Australian winemaking. How about the future of Australian wine? What are your feelings? We made a few mistakes in the past, relaxed a bit too much. It's very easy to grow grapes in Australia, you know, especially if you want to grow Shiraz. And I think in the last 10 to 15 years, certainly the last five years, there's been a real focus by Australian winemakers on um, choosing the right varieties in the right sites and just focusing on the absolute top end. That's the exciting future. Like I think Australian Chardonnay is one of the most exciting wines in the whole world. We're constantly benchmarking our wines against white burgundy and you know uh, Chardonnay from other parts of the world and doing them blind and in almost every case some of the high-end Australian stuff comes out on top so we've got past that cultural cringe I think of trying to make burgundy and uh, we are now making Yarra Valley Chardonnay and Yarra Valley Pinot in there and we've, we're, I guess no surprise it's pretty exciting stuff yeah. Next up I meet winemaker and all-round hero, Mac Forbes, who learned his trade working at vineyards around Europe before returning to his native Yarra Valley. Mac passionately believes that by planting the right vines for each particular vineyard, the region has the potential to make wines as good as anywhere in the world. I think I just like wines that are delicious and interesting and have personality. And this for me is, is an area that I, I think we haven't even tapped the, the potential of, of what we can express here. So you're all about site-specific vineyards. Can you just explain a little bit about what that actually means? Instead of dumping 10 or 20 varieties in every site, we're saying looking at suitability and we're being a lot more sympathetic to, to the fruit and how we handle it. I mean, I've got two young kids and the personalities, you, you watch them bubble to the surface and I think Growing grapes from different sites is very much the same. We can't treat this vineyard like any of our other vineyards. They all are so strong in their personalities and quirks that I just can't bring myself to, to blend them and lose those elements. And I think the more that we keep them separate and can give them that voice, and the more I think we've got something quite unique here that other regions don't have. I've now made my way to the Mornington Peninsula on Australia's south coast and it's a glorious sunny day. But there's a cool breeze in the air, it's coming straight from Antarctica, flows in over the vineyards, giving freshness and elegance to those grapes that make the wines. My next stop is at the Stonia Winery. The stunning coastal location is one of the most impressive I've ever visited. This has got to be one of the most beautiful vineyards in the entire history of the world. Unbelievable. Can I put a camp bed in here and have a snooze? Yeah, for sure, go for it. Vineyard manager Luke Buckley describes to me how this incredible setting influences the style of wine that Stonia produces. We've got an overlook of the Stonia vineyards. You can see uh, we've got uh, bays behind us, which gives us a good maritime influence on the grapes. You can really feel actually there's a little breeze in the air and it's, it's certainly cool, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's a southerly breeze that comes through. So we find that the vineyards here don't get too much heat on them, which means the grapes have a, a slower sort of ripening period. So literally this breeze gives freshness to the wine. Yeah, that's right, yep. As curious as it may sound, the Stonia Winery was designed by Daryl Jackson, the same architect who created part of the MCG in Melbourne. 
That's a bit like having your house plans drawn up by the designer of Lord's Cricket Ground. I think in the UK, you know, we got involved with Aussie wine through things like very big Shiraz mm. and very, very oaky Chardonnay, but these yeah. wines, your wines aren't like that, are they? Yeah, we try to um, have a focus on Pinot and Chardonnay production. I think it's what uh, the Mornington Peninsula does really well. And we're trying to uh, maybe educate people a little bit into wines with a little bit more finesse and a little bit more style. That's lovely. This trip's given me a glimpse beyond those big fruity reds and that rich style of white wine. I've tasted incredibly nimble wines from coastal Mornington Peninsula and hilly Yarra Valley. Things like Pinot Noir with real crunchy fruit to it and Chardonnay that's got a real spring in its step. But I'd urge you to taste even more. I think Western Australia is fantastic. Riesling from Clare Valley. You've got Semillon in Sydney. I think it's really worth giving these wines another look because Australian wine has been reborn.